In the immediate aftermath of the crucifixion, the followers of Jesus numbered barely a hundred. They were a persecuted underground cult on the verge of being wiped out. Yet within a few decades, this cult had thousands of followers throughout the Roman Empire. It spread through mighty cities like Ephesus, where previously pagan worshipers had built the Temple of Artemis, one of the wonders of the ancient world. It swept away the old beliefs. It traveled as far as the deserts of Turkey to Cappadocia, where a mysterious people carved underground cities and extraordinary churches from volcanic rock. And in the beginning, the message of Christianity was carried on the roads that Rome had built for its soldiers by one man, a preacher named Paul. In his life, he walked 20,000 miles, bringing change and upheaval wherever he went. Now, using the latest research and computer graphic imaging, a team of experts will try to reveal the world that he knew, the places that he traveled to and transformed. This is the lost world of St. Paul and the first Christians. Thirty-six A.D. in the city of Jerusalem, Jewish leaders are doing everything in their power to crush a dangerous new cult, the cult of Christ. Just three years after Jesus' crucifixion, only a handful of his followers survives. If they can all be killed, their religion will die too. A conservative Jewish teacher presides over this persecution. His name is Saul, and he personally supervises the execution by stoning of one of the Christian leaders. Yet in time, this man will become Jesus' greatest messenger. More than half of the New Testament is made up from his writings. Many argue that without him, there would be no Christianity. Saul became Paul, and he shaped our world. Now, our investigators want to uncover the world that shaped him. The story starts in southwest Turkey, in Paul's hometown of Tarsus. It's still a busy town today, but historian Mark Wilson wants to find traces of the city that Paul knew and which helped mold an extraordinary character. It uh, lies in the very fertile plain with much agriculture in the area. Uh, textile production is prevalent uh, in the area as well. So as you look around Tarsus today, uh, it's a very uh, prosperous and booming city. It's become a site of Christian pilgrimage. This is the area in Tarsus where Paul lived, and all pilgrims to the city visit this area. It's widely believed that this well was in use 2,000 years ago and that St. Paul drank its water. This would have been a water source for his family. And because of this, many people believe this is holy water in the well. There's little in Paul's own writings about his hometown, but other sources reveal a striking and significant fact. Tarsus once stood on the shores of the Mediterranean. The sea has since receded several miles, but this was once a major port. In the first century, it was a very bustling city on a major crossroads and also a noted university town, the Athens of the East. And just one block from Paul's well, new evidence is emerging that gives us new insight into life here at that time. Recent building works were halted when workers found ancient ruins buried right beneath the town center. Examining the find, the archaeologists realized that they were looking at a row of stores, an ancient mall dating back to the first century, Paul's time. The walls of this excavation pit are marked with layer on layer of artifacts. Successive generations lived here. But it's the discovery of a street at the bottom of the pit that provides the biggest clue. It's a paved road and it's dead straight. Only one civilization built like this, the Romans. 
Local archaeologist Nadir Durgan points out other evidence of Roman occupation. You can see the rain gutters each side of the road. Oh, amazing. Yes, Look at those. The white stones. And it's visible, there are a lot of wheel traces on the road, wheel tracks. You know, carriages, carriages use the road. As a port, Tarsus was wealthy. That made it an attractive target for the Romans, and they occupied it in the decades before Paul's birth. This Roman presence would have a major influence on the way he would be brought up. The street is amazing because the young Paul probably played and walked along the street when he was a boy growing up in this city. Archaeological investigations enable us to recreate what ancient Tarsus would have looked like. This was a busy commercial center. Paul would have come into contact with people of different nationalities, different faiths. Perhaps Paul came down here and bought some groceries or uh, traded in produce. Uh, his family, of course, were leather workers, tent makers, and they would have worked down in this central area of the city as well. Tradition has it that his family were craftsmen and traders. They certainly had the means to give him a privileged education. He's raised a strict Jew and called by the Jewish name of Saul. But he's also a Roman citizen, something which will prove advantageous throughout his life. And he's taught Greek, the ancient international language of diplomacy. He grows up part of the establishment, a member of a learned Jewish elite. His first taste of travel is to Jerusalem. He goes there as part of his education. And this is where he first encounters the followers of Jesus, a young revolutionary teacher whose popular support makes him a major threat to the authorities. To Saul, Jesus is the enemy. In fact, he was so zealous that he was involved in persecuting this new cult of uh, people who are following Jesus uh, as the Messiah. There's no evidence that Saul ever met Jesus, but we know he considered his teachings blasphemous. And after the crucifixion, he devoted his life to wiping out his followers. This was basically a nascent uh, group that was forming in cities throughout Palestine, and Paul thought if he could kill and deprive uh, these communities of their leadership, perhaps he could snuff out this new religion. It is this background, conservative, traditional, violently anti-Christian, that makes the story of Paul's conversion all the more remarkable. The New Testament says that he pursued a group of Jesus' followers who had fled to the city of Damascus. On the road, he was struck down by a blinding light. It said that Jesus appeared to him in a vision and Saul repented, transforming himself from that moment on into a messenger of the gospel. Well, certainly his dramatic conversion on the road to Damascus uh, was the beginning of his own spiritual journey. Here the persecutor now becomes the uh, ardent follower of Jesus as the risen Lord. He continues on to Damascus, where he is baptized, taking the name of Paul, and his mission begins. Paul begins a journey that will last the rest of his life and cover an estimated 20,000 miles. It is made easier by the enormous network of Roman roads. We're walking along a section of Roman road about 10 miles north of Tarsus. This gives us a good idea of what Paul experienced as he traveled along these roads throughout the Eastern Mediterranean region. These were being constructed by the Roman military to make long distance travel as fast as possible. Without them, the government of their vast and growing empire would have been impossible. The remarkable preservation of a Roman road like this shows how well they were made. We're looking here at the original stone pavement called the uh, meddling that was on the surface of the road, as well as the original curbing. Roman roads are built to a strict formula. First a trench is dug, then packed with boulders and sand to make a solid base. This is topped with layers of smaller stone and clay, and then paving stones, often made of basalt, are laid on top. They're sloped so that rainwater runs into the guttering at the sides. Paul starts his mission in Antioch, the provincial capital of Syria. His followers there are the first people to be called Christians. 
And he then keeps moving through all the big cities of the region, seeking the places where the old religions are most powerful. He will preach his message in the shadow of the Temple of Artemis. It is one of the wonders of the ancient world and the biggest pagan temple on the planet. In 52 AD, St. Paul comes to Ephesus, the fourth largest city in the ancient world. He is just one of tens of thousands of pilgrims visiting the city. Most have come to venerate the goddess Artemis. Artemis was the goddess of the hunt. Uh, she was also the protectress of virgins. And we know that during the uh, yearly festivals, this was a time when the young unmarried women would find their spouses. Artemis was one of the most important gods in Greek and Roman religion. And here she had a shrine to match her status. The temple of Artemis was known far and wide. Its image was molded on the coins that circulated the region. This was one of the seven wonders of the world and in Paul's time, the largest temple in existence. As a magnet for pagan pilgrims, it played a key role in Paul's plan. Ephesus became a wonderful base for him because the Temple of Artemis was here and he used it for his own benefit because the many people who came into the city to uh, participate in the various festivities uh, were a, an audience for him to preach the gospel to. Our investigators will reconstruct the Temple of Artemis as Paul would have seen it. The evidence suggests that the people of Ephesus used revolutionary construction techniques. But all that remains today are a few marble blocks recovered from beneath 20 feet of silt. To build this temple required a monumental task. Not only did they have to build it, they needed to figure out how to build it. They'd never done anything like this before. In their desire to honor their goddess, the temple's builders and engineers set themselves a challenging task. The decision was made to build the temple entirely from marble, and the nearest source of marble lay eight miles away. It all had to be transported back to the construction site. Archaeologist Julian Bennett is seeking to discover how it was done. Gangs of men would be working with metal chisels and hammers all the way around to create a narrow trough less than six inches wide. You can still see the surviving trough there. And then once they got the channel down to the level of the block they wanted, you came from the side, you hit it with steel wedges and the block would lift off. An estimated 51,000 tons of marble were needed. The Ephesians didn't do the hard work themselves. They delegated it to slaves and criminals. A common punishment for crime was to be sentenced to work in the quarries. You weren't expected to live too long and you probably didn't. Once they'd carved out the blocks, they still had to get them to the temple construction site. In the 21st century, quarrymen rely on heavy machinery. A few hundred yards from the ancient quarry, gray marble is still being extracted from the same site. The average block is 13 tons, about the same size as the blocks used to build the Temple of Artemis. Today, a machine makes it look easy. When the temple was built, sheer manpower. But the temple architects used all their ingenuity to speed up the process. They invented a method that would make them better stone movers than even the Egyptians. They turned the square blocks into wheels. Wooden cradles were built around the cut rock so that it could easily be rolled the eight miles into town. Once they had the raw materials, they could set about building one of the greatest temples the world has ever seen. In its heyday, it would attract more pilgrims than the Temple of the Jews in Jerusalem. Today, the site where it once stood is a flooded marsh. It's hard to imagine why such a huge temple would be constructed here on a piece of land no modern builder would touch. 
The Roman historian Pliny claims the marshy ground was chosen as a precaution against frequent earthquakes. It would cushion the tremors. Another theory is that a meteor landed here. The ancients thought it was a god sent from heaven and constructed their temple around it. Either way, the location presented the builders with a serious problem. How to construct what would be one of the wonders of the world in a swamp. They started by creating a dry base, treading down a layer of charcoal, then covering it with sheep fleece to prevent water rising up. Slate blocks were put on top. The floor of slate and marble was built eight feet high to stay above the water level. It spanned an area 255 feet wide and 425 feet long. This sturdy platform supported a forest of columns. This one is 45 feet high, but Pliny reveals that the originals were a massive 60 feet, six stories tall. To achieve this ambitious engineering task, the architects used scaffolding. They assembled the columns from a series of stacked drums, each weighing more than eight tons. A column consisted of around 30 drums, and once assembled, they were fluted with hammer and chisel. This was done an incredible 127 times. Amongst the ruins, Aaron Marshall finds evidence of how they built the temple roof. So having gotten the columns up, now you have the task of actually erecting the lintels. The lintels are all of those stone blocks which you have to put on top of the columns. Again, it's Pliny who tells us how the lintels were positioned. It was crucial to get it precisely right. What they did was they erected a, a ramp of reed bags all the way up to the level of the top of the columns. Then they placed the lintels on top of them and then poked a hole in the reed bag so all the sand came out. Slowly enough so that the lintels could be adjusted. You have to bear in mind, these aren't mortared. They have to be exact. It took 120 years to complete the temple. We can now bring to life this incredible part of St. Paul's lost world, an astonishing building that was bigger than anything that had gone before. It was the focal point of huge activity, all centered around the cult of the goddess. An awning in the roof bathed her statue in light. And the cult of Artemis was by no means the city's only religion. The Romans believed in many gods, and they tolerated the traditional beliefs of the peoples they conquered. So at first, Paul and his new religion are well received. And a few miles from the temple in the city center, Paul discovered something that will allow him to deliver his message to an audience of unprecedented size. We're entering one of the most spectacular buildings in Ephesus. 25,000 people came here for games and for protest. St. Paul entered here. The city's theater, also built from white marble, was undergoing expansion while Paul was in the city. 459 feet across, containing 66 rows of seats, it was once the largest theater in the country. Paul would have come here and addressed one of the biggest audiences of his life. This was the perfect theater. It seated 25,000 people, and the acoustics allowed for a dramatic impact. The superb acoustics derive from the design of the theater seating. These seats are wider, and the further up you go, they're narrower. And this concave shape helps to retain the sound in the theater. But the theater wasn't designed simply for speeches and plays. The partition that shields the front row indicates that Paul shared his stage with more dangerous entertainment. The wall is high to protect the spectators from the death, from the blood and the guts of what went on here. The recent discovery of a dedicated graveyard in Ephesus confirms that this theater was an arena where gladiators fought. 
These immensely popular contests drew large audiences. And as far as Paul was concerned, the Gladiator Games attracted even more people to hear his message. Because what separated St. Paul from Jesus' other disciples is that he doesn't just target Jews. He aims to convert people of all faiths. His methods would cause Christianity to become a worldwide religion. Ultimately, they would bring about the downfall of the Roman Empire. And yet it was the Romans' own engineering skill which gave St. Paul the opportunity he needed. St. Paul lived and preached in the city of Ephesus, part of modern-day Turkey, for two and a half years. The largest city in Roman Asia, with an open-minded and cosmopolitan population, it was the ideal place to seek new converts. Archaeologist Julian Bennett discovered that the way the Romans built their towns gave Paul a unique chance to bring huge numbers of people to Christianity. But he also finds that this city had its eye fixed on more worldly pursuits than theology and a new religion. Well, every Roman city would have had a brothel. This was an everyday fact of Roman life. Paul is in a city with a reputation for pleasure-seeking. A male-dominated society when a young man would not marry until he was in his mid-twenties or thirties. A place like Ephesus, a harbor city, would have had several brothels. Right in the center of town, early archaeologists found an intriguing signpost. It featured a foot and a heart. This particular building, when they excavated it in the 19th century, they found a number of oil lamps here with scenes of erotic art on them, and also an inscription referring to young people. And so the excavators came to the natural conclusion this was the main brothel of uh, Ephesus. It occupies such a prominent corner. Prostitution was an important source of income for the Roman administration. We even know that the prostitutes paid a tax to the city and to the government, and that this tax was the equivalent of one sexual act, and they had to pay this tax every month. But it wasn't just about pleasure. The fundamental challenge for the town administrators was providing vital amenities for over 200,000 people. The most important was running water. The city's source was eight miles away in the Marnus Valley. Diverting it into Ephesus required an extraordinary feat of engineering. Well, here we have it. This is the aqueduct bridge for Rome and Ephesus. This was built something like 2,000 years ago, uh, before the time of St. Paul's visit here, but it's still in incredibly good condition. An aqueduct this size needed funding beyond what the city could pay for, but it gave politicians a chance to gain favor with the masses. It gives us the name of the man, Gaius Sextilius Polio, with his wife and also their son, uh, for the people of Ephesus, Sua Pecunia Facundum Curavit. We pay for this from our own pocket. It is a way of making certain the people of Ephesus remember who you are. Or perhaps more to the point, uh, when election time comes round again, remember my stepson. Whatever their motive, the private individuals who paid for projects like this did a great service for the city. Polio's aqueduct carried vital water supplies into Ephesus, where they entered an elaborate cistern. Ah, this is precisely the sort of thing we're looking for when following an aqueduct. And they're absolutely jam-packed with calcium carbonate. It's calcium that's been dissolved out of the water coming down with the aqueduct through these limestone hills. Come into the city somewhere in this area, onto this structure. And over here, a section which has been broken loose. If I can lift this, and you have the flange at the one end, the socket at the other end. The flange would always be on the downstream side. So, very good example of Roman technology. 
Pipes like these ran in a network down the hill. There were 100 gallons a day for each Ephesian, comparable to the provision made in most modern cities. Paul and most other citizens got their water from communal fountains, but some buildings were supplied directly. One was the bathhouse. The Roman baths were the focal point of the city's social life. Here the Ephesians discussed politics, philosophy, and Paul's religious ideas. Christianity spread by word of mouth, and it was from places like this that Paul's message began to pass to a wider audience. The bathhouses were places equipped with what was then high technology, including an underfloor heating system called a hypocost. And we are, in fact, very lucky at this particular point. This is a very good preserved cross-section of a typical hypercore system. So you can see the pillars here which support the main floor, a very thick, very hard pink Roman plaster known as Opus Signinum. It retains heat. On top of this, we're very lucky, marble slabs from the floor. Hot air flooded the underfloor space, spreading up the walls to heat the room from all sides. Hot water was piped into the bath. The dirty water from the bathhouse was put to good use. It flushed out waste from other buildings. And just next door is one of the most important facilities found in any large Roman city. And sure enough, a really nice Roman public latrine marble seats, nice and cool in the summer, not so nice perhaps in the winter. And you'd sit here next to your neighbor, talk about the weather, gladiatorial games, what life was like. You have a nice little water trough in front because the Romans did not have toilet paper. Instead, every Roman carried a personal sponge and they would have the sponge on the end of a stick, dip it in the end of the water, now you see what this is for. Our evidence for this comes from an unusual source. We are told that one gladiator, rather than go out and fight his opponent, decided to commit suicide. And he did so by making the excuse of going to the latrine and grabbing hold of a sponge and choking himself to death with this. So that's how we know about the sponges. While Paul would have used these public restrooms, the upper classes had the privacy of their luxury homes. Today, the remains of these lavish houses are protected in a climate-controlled shelter. St. Paul would have seen them being built and furnished in exotic marble brought from across the Roman Empire to advertise their owner's wealth. Each house had a private bathroom, constantly flushed by the continuous flow of the aqueduct system. This is a very high quality latrine, small private latrine. We know in Rome, at least, we assume in Ephesus as well, they had different size water pipes and they calculated the tax you paid by the size of your water pipe. So to have a private toilet like this is very much a sign of status. The wealthiest households could even afford an early form of air conditioning, walls of water. You needed water every day. Uh, just to stay alive, you need water for washing, for cooking, but it helps to cool down the air as well. So all in all, this must have been an extremely pleasant place to be in, especially in the middle of the summer. The Ephesian ruling classes enjoyed high quality of life, and suddenly Paul threatened to disrupt that. Not only did he undermine their pagan beliefs, but with it, he damaged the city's most important trade. Religion was big business in this Ephesus. Its market fed off pilgrims to the temple. Silver statuettes of the goddess Artemis sold as charms brought in vast revenue. But the arrival of Christianity meant that people were turning their backs on Ephesus. 25,000 people gathered in the great theater to hear a silversmith called Demetrius speak. He told them that Paul was not only insulting their goddess, but also threatening their main source of income. He stirred the crowd to the point where an anti-Christian riot erupted. Tradition has it that to appease the angry mob, Paul was thrown into prison. It's thought that was where he would write some of the letters that would make up so much of the New Testament. 
On his release, he was told to leave Ephesus. But his new religion had already taken hold. The city was becoming a city of Christians. And the silversmith Demetrius was right. The city of Ephesus declined with the cult of Artemis. It was the beginning of a long, slow collapse that will see the temple fall into ruin. Paul moved on. His message would have an equally powerful effect elsewhere. It would reach to the very furthest parts of the Roman Empire, transforming every community it touched. Next, we investigate the religious society that sprung up in the wake of St. Paul. In the strange land of Cappadocia, a mysterious group of Christians would seek safety by building a secret world underground. Fifteen million years ago, a series of volcanic eruptions around the Mediterranean threw up immense clouds of ash, blanketing the land layer upon layer. Over time, this created a bizarre, otherworldly place. Today, it's called Cappadocia. Some scholars believe that St. Paul came here to preach his new religion. Our investigators are trying to understand the part that this alien landscape played in the birth of Christianity. And the best way to see what traces remain is from above. It stretches over 15,000 square miles. It's dotted with sculpted cones, pyramids, and obelisks. The ash is up to 300 feet thick. Each layer is of a different consistency, and this means that erosion by wind and rain has created a remarkable, uneven terrain. Early explorers thought the shapes must have been carved by some ancient race. The buildings do show the skill and craftsmanship of a highly sophisticated people. Their works can still be seen, and it still impresses. We see some steps there cutting into the rock, leading up to somebody's habitation. It's an incredibly gorgeous place, beautiful. The word Cappadocia derives from the Persian for land of beautiful horses. The Cappadocians were famed as suppliers of prize animals for the Roman army. Down on the ground, Veronica Callis chooses the best form of local transport and heads for the Alara Valley, a canyon cut deep into the ash. She finds an extraordinary concentration of ancient churches carved into the rock face. There are over 100 of them in this 10-mile valley alone. It's clear that Paul's message had an immense impact. The churches are decorated with frescoes that depict stories from the New Testament. Veronica wants to trace Paul's story back further. She heads for a settlement a few miles north of the canyon to try to discover how early Cappadocians lived. What Paul would have come across was an extraordinary community of cave dwellers. This settlement has long since been abandoned, but its ancient inhabitants left behind tantalizing glimpses of their lives. It's a large square room and it has a conical vault that leads up into a, a ventilation shaft. There's a chimney. They lit fires here. This is most likely where they cooked. This is an oven with fire uh, burning uh, down below and perhaps a grill. To the trained eye, another room reveals evidence of industry. This is known as a pit loom, and this is a fine example where you might have a wooden frame erected around the sitter's uh, lap in order to weave textiles. There are also pits for storing clay jugs or amphoras. Using these clues sculpted 2,000 years ago from ash, Veronica is building up a picture of what the Cappadocians were like. The people who lived here were uh, said to be very uh, rugged, uh, the cowboys of the empire. And there's a story that when a viper would bite a Cappadocian, the viper would die. This is how tough the Cappadocians were. 
And yet living on the trade route between Europe and Asia, these people were becoming rich. The Cappadocians' lifestyle was sophisticated and comfortable. A large ceremonial hall indicates the high status of the people living here. Most of the ancient world's freestanding buildings have long since crumbled away. But Cappadocia's volcanic ash retains a record of its architecture. It offers a unique glimpse of the lost world in which St. Paul operated, and there is clear evidence that his religion gained a foothold here. This is a really nice church. It's uh, in a basilica style with columns and piers and arcades separating this very large barrel vaulted nave uh, from side aisles. And here we're entering into the sanctuary where the altar should be. Although these columns appear to have been built from bricks and mortar, they are actually cut from the volcanic ash. Their elaborate style simply mimics the building techniques of the time. Ash is easily worked with simple tools, but hollowing out a sophisticated home like this would have taken many months and a great deal of skill and planning. Veronica has analyzed each of the 15 rooms here, and now, using computer graphics, we can reveal the complex structure of this settlement. This residence is the largest and most elaborate in Cappadocia, covering 3,000 square yards, about half the size of a football field. The kitchen, ceremonial halls, and church mark it out as an estate for the elite. It was home to a large, aristocratic, and publicly Christian family. This place is part of St. Paul's legacy. The architectural details of the Church of Dermish Kadir have been remarkably well preserved. They give us a rare insight into how early Christians worshipped. This is a nice representation of the kind of church that emerged immediately after uh, St. Paul's times. There are no paintings here, and yet the architecture is very, very elegant. You can imagine what an amazing place this would have been around the fourth to the sixth century. This is known as an ambo. That is a pulpit. Uh, this is a very important feature in early Christian uh, churches. So this is the closest thing we have to the time of St. Paul. They mostly stood then. It seems that uh, people prayed with their hands open and their chest up to the sky, uh, not bowing down and closed. The congregation stood around the ambo in the nave, facing the altar in the central apse. To left and right were side aisles containing a baptismal font. Behind them was the church entrance, the narthex. Today, it is lined with empty tombs. But it was not always easy for the Cappadocians to hold on to their Christian faith. The more the early church grew, the more Rome saw it as a threat. So it went literally underground. Next, we reveal the extraordinary subterranean world created by the Cappadocians to provide shelter and safety for tens of thousands of people. For 30 years, Paul traveled the Roman world, spreading the message of Christianity. His journey entered its final phase in Jerusalem. Around 60 AD, he was arrested for a breach of Jewish law. He faced death, but exercised his right as a Roman citizen to go to trial in Rome itself. This was a dangerous gamble. The Roman Emperor Nero saw Christians as a threat. By the mid-60s, the situation of the Christians in Rome was quite precarious. The Romans recognized that they were not a sect of Judaism, but were a separate religion. And when fire engulfed the city, destroying hundreds of buildings, Nero needed someone to blame. After the fire in Rome in 64, Nero was looking for a convenient scapegoat, and he pointed to the Christians as the cause of the fire. And this brought great persecution. Paul was well known as a Christian leader. Tradition says that Nero singled him out. He had him beheaded but he couldn't kill Paul's message. 
In the lands where he had preached, the Christian faith had taken root, and slowly, over centuries, Christianity came to rule the Roman Empire. In 313 AD, the Roman Emperor Constantine became a Christian. The pagan gods were swept aside, their temples destroyed, replaced with the first Christian churches. And yet that golden age is short-lived. It meant the fate of the empire and the church became linked. Christianity grew while Rome remained strong and when Rome declined, her enemies became the church's enemies. This shift in fortunes was felt even by the remote cave-dwelling Christians of Cappadocia. By the fifth century AD, as Rome fell, they found themselves at the mercy of Arab warlords. They had no means to fight back. They took an incredible course of action. In their tens of thousands, Cappadocia's Christians went underground. It wasn't until the 1960s that this extraordinary story was revealed. The chance find of a secret passageway led to a series of bizarre discoveries. Beneath this landscape are hundreds of miles of man-made tunnels. Their entrances are incredibly well hidden but opening these cunningly concealed doorways gives us a new insight into the story of the first Christians. Investigations have revealed that the tunnels formed self-contained settlements with all the features of a sophisticated society. People survived down here thanks to ingenious ventilation shafts carved into the rock. It's quite amazing. If you stand here, you feel a breeze and we are uh, several meters underneath ground level. In fact, they reached the water table. So these function both as uh, ventilation shafts and as wells to pump water from down below. We have a large square, uh, what looks like a room, but in fact, it's a bin for grapes and the grapes would be pressed. And so wine, the liquid from pressing, will come through here and then be deposited in this rock cut space here. Life underground cannot have been easy. It's hard to imagine how these people survived without seeing the sun. They didn't have a sense of day and night down there. And I think that must have created some very strange psychology in people. They were clearly desperate. They secured the entrances to these complexes with heavy wheel-like doors. Some remain sealed to this day. And two stories down, there's hard proof of what drove them here. This is uh, what looks like an altar. Uh, we don't really know why this is here in the middle. The altar usually is in the uh, apse. Two apses side by side, that's how we know that it's a church. They'd been forced underground because of their faith. It was natural that they would build altars to worship. 40 settlements like this have been discovered. The largest is eight stories deep, sinking 90 yards underground with 20 miles of tunnels. It's believed that up to 20,000 people could hide in this one complex alone. And it's believed that there are many more such networks still to be found. It would be another five centuries before peace returned to this region. For 300 years, Christians used these tunnels and endured enormous hardship to preserve their faith. That faith was St. Paul's legacy. Paul's role in early Christianity has been said by some to be really the founder of Christianity, but really the message he proclaimed was that of Jesus himself. Uh, he wrote half of the New Testament, uh, 13 books are attributed to Paul. He established churches all the way from Antioch to Rome, and these became the foundation for later Christianity. St. Paul spent a lifetime traveling through the cities of the ancient world. He challenged the might of the Roman Empire. When he began, Christianity was a faith in danger of extinction. 
but through the efforts of this one man, it not only survived, but flourished to become one of the world's major religions. Thank you.